Amen. It's good to see everyone here on the Sunday morning. Our ushers have a little handout I want to give to you, so if uh, they'll pass it out. A little outline of the message this morning. We're beginning a new subject on stewardship. Over the month of January, we do this every January. We look at the subject of stewardship, and it's a good way to start off a new year. Can I hear it? Amen. 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 Have you found out that you can't outgive God? Amen. The title of the series today is The Cycle of Victorious Giving. We did this several years ago. Um, and so it's a repeat series. I don't remember, I can't remember how long ago it was. I tried to look, but uh, anyway, it's been several years. In this cycle of four steps, we will cover each week. Today, we're going to look at Trust to Live. Uh, giving connects us to God. Next Sunday, we're actually going to have a missionary couple with us, David and Faith, or excuse me, Daniel and Faith Lund. They're going to be here Sunday morning. Daniel Lund is the son of Dan and Viola Lund. And then Viola passed away a few years ago, and then he married Paula Lund. And we supported them for many years. Dan and Paula, I think they have retired now, but their son Daniel is a missionary. And then his wife is also the daughter of a missionary and the family that we've supported for many years, Quentin and Elizabeth McGee. Quentin and Elizabeth McGee have three daughters named Faith, Hope, and Charity. Well, Faith is married to Daniel, and Daniel and Faith Lund are going to be here next Sunday, and uh, we're going to enjoy uh, meeting them. And I've never met them in person. I've just talked to them over the phone, so we're looking forward to that service next Sunday. And then on January 17th, the second part of our series, Commit to Grow, on the 24th, the light to give, and on the 31st, rest to inherit. And these steps are all found in Psalm 37. So if you take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 37. Message again, trust to live. We're going to read all seven verses, I think maybe the PowerPoint just has one verse listed, verse 3, which is going to be our main verse, but uh, we're going to read all seven verses. I'm just so glad I can talk again. And for having the crud for a month, it feels pretty good to be able to talk and sing and not be messed up. Psalm 37. Verse 1, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him and He will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for Him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Father in heaven, we just give you praise today. Thank you, Lord, for this time of worship in your house with your people. Gather around your word. And we just ask that you would speak to us, each one, and help us to live our lives in accordance with your perfect will. In Jesus' name, and everybody that's happy in Jesus, say amen. Amen. All right. How many of you would be interested in a little success in your life? Anybody, anybody want some success? All right. All uh, right. What would that look like to you? What would success look like to you? I won't get to sermon this second. This is just a little interaction here. What would success look like? Cody, what would success look like to you if you want to be successful, right? What would that look like? Don't know? <laughs> Make straight A's in school? That'd be good. Okay. Right. Volunteer? What would, what would that look like to you? If I said, you want to be successful, what would that look like? Huh? All your kids serving God. All right. Somebody else? 
Having money? Having your bill enough to make ends meet? Yeah. Not having so much month left after your money runs out? Okay. Having the resources to be able to work for the Lord? All right, there's a lot of that. Have a job, right? The ability, to put, the ability to put all of your trust in the Lord. All right. Donna? Going to heaven. Yeah. All right. You ready to go right now? Right. <laughs> it's like the preacher said, everybody want to go to heaven, raise your hand. And everybody raise their hand. There's one old man in the back. He said, Sir, would you want to go? Well, I thought she was getting up a bus load right now. I wasn't quite ready to go this morning. <laughs> anyway, we, we all want to be successful and find success in our life. Well, the passage that we just read in Psalms 37 give us some principles of how to govern a successful and a victorious life. And we're emphasizing verse 3 today where it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy it. Safe pasture. These principles can be applied in the area of Christian living called stewardship. Now, what do we mean by stewardship? It's not a term we use as much today as in Jesus' day. We don't talk about how somebody is a steward or they're a good steward or whatever. We, we rarely use that word anymore. But a word that we use today that really means the same thing is a manager. Go to McDonald's and think something's not right with your food, you might ask to speak to the manager. They're like the steward. A steward is one who manages another person's affairs. In today's world, like we said, we would call them managers. We are managers or stewards of what God owns. And what does God own? Everything. Everything, everything, everything. Amen. How we spend our time, we've been given, and the resources we've been given says a lot about us as Christians. It's been said that if we want to discover what's really important in our lives, all we have to do is take a look at our checkbook and our calendar. And we'll find out what is important to us. So over the next month, we're going to be talking about a subject that makes some people uncomfortable a little bit. But God's Word contains more than 2,000 verses that directly address the topic of finance. Jesus Himself taught on it. He said He knew that wherever your treasure is, that's where you'll find your heart. And so it's important that our hearts be in the right place. Amen? First of all, we're going to look at trust be in the doorway. Trust is the doorway. Like I said, I hope you've got this little yellow sheet. You can, If you have a pen, you can kind of follow along there. And if not, I think it's up on the screen. The doorway to successful living is found in our text today. And again, we read it already. Trust in the Lord and do good. You will live in the land and safely in the land and prosper. What a great promise. We trust in the Lord. We will be live safely in the land and prosper. If we really want to live, we must first trust. Amen? Amen. Psalm 24, 1 tells us that God is a God of abundance. How do you know there's no shortage with God? He's a God of abundance. He owns it all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the taters under those hills. That's what one, one old preacher said. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Psalms 24, 1 says, The world and all its people belong to Him. God created it all and He owns it all. But we are to lean hard on the Lord. We are to trust Him, though it is contrary to human nature. It's contrary to human nature to trust Him. People would rather lean on their own understanding, on their own judgment, than what the Lord says. An example from Scripture is that the children of Israel... We're told that God would give them the land that they were to get to go and to possess it. And so they sent spies to check out the land. And when they came back, they were saying, oh yeah, we can do it, right? That's what two of them were saying. They sent out 12. 
the other ten back, the other ten came back and said, No way, Jose, we can't do it. They're much too strong for us. There's giants there. We cannot do it. But Joshua and Caleb come back and said, Yes, we can certainly do it. And all the while God had said, It's yours. So lest we get mad at them, sometimes we do the same thing. God's got a lot of promises in here. And He's told us certain things, but yet sometimes we fail to trust Him. All the while God had led them and fed them throughout the wilderness. He fed them manna from heaven, quail, water from the rock. I mean, He took care of them. He didn't even let their shoes wear out for 40 years. Listen to these words from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 29 through 32. But I said to you, don't be afraid, uh, shocked or afraid of them. The Lord your God is going ahead of you. He will fight for you just as you saw Him do in Egypt. And you saw how the Lord your God cared for you all along the way as you traveled through the wilderness, just as a father cares for a child. Now He has brought you to this place. But even after all He did, you refused to trust the Lord your God. They refused to trust the Lord their God. A failure to trust in God's promises. Too often our trust is misplaced. Psalm 27 says some trust in chariots and some in horses. Meaning people put their trust in the wrong things. They put their trust in the government or the stock market or education or casinos or the lottery or a job or maybe in other people rather than the Lord. But Jesus said in John 14 1, trust in the Lord God and trust also in me. We're to trust in the Lord. If we're going to be happy, we need to trust in Him that He's going to take care of every need of our life. Secondly, the challenge of trusting. One of the greatest challenges of trust is that trusting God means we believe what we cannot see. It means God is at work carrying out His purposes even when we do not see evidence of Him doing so. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we want, of what we do not see. Trust is the basis of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Noah was told by the Lord to build a ship because it was going to rain. It had never rained ever on the earth. The Lord had another way of water. It didn't rain. The people didn't know what rain was. And so he said, there's going to be a flood. Everything is going to be flooded. I want you to build this boat. Does anybody know how long it took Noah to build the boat? 100 years. The Lord told him that when he was 500 years old to build a boat. When he was 600, the flood came. It took him 100 years. Abraham was told to go to a place God would show him. God said, Abraham, get your family, and I want you to go and leave where you're at here, and I'm going to go to a place where I'm going to show you. Not very many of us would like just ordering a U-Haul and not knowing where we're going. We're just going to start driving. Which way? West, maybe. North, I don't know. South. That's exactly what Abraham did. Moses trusted God when he led two to three million Israelites out of Egypt. They came to the Red Sea, just as I was saying about earlier, that he had to trust God to handle that. I read an interesting article that they have found, I guess, uh, remnants. Archaeologists, archaeologists have discovered remnants of a large army that crossed the Red Sea. They found chariot pieces and bones of horses and men. Recently. Anybody else see that? Anybody else read Facebook? <laughs> Is that a reliable place to find stuff? <laughs> Somebody posted, I didn't have time to check it out, that they had found the uh, remains of a large army that had passed the Red Sea. I think that's pretty cool. Trusting God reminds us of who is in control. Trusting God completely means having faith that He knows what is best for your life even when you don't understand. 
When we trust, God supplies. Number three, in his book, Trusting God, Jerry Bridges emphasizes, trusting God does not mean we do not experience pain. It means that we believe God is at work through the occasion of our pain for ultimate good. It will often mean that we may have to say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. I trust you anyway. My favorite passage in the Old Testament is this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If you know it, say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Trust. That's a, a great scripture on trusting God. When we trust God, it verifies that He is our source. If God is your source, you're in good hands. Amen? Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, The highest heavens and the earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. When we've taken the initial step of placing our trust in the Creator, we find He can and does supply out of His abundance. Moses didn't water, didn't, didn't water, didn't worry about water levels. And he didn't water about worry levels either. <laughs> Moses didn't worry about water levels. He simply trusted God to part the sea. David didn't worry about his size and strength compared to Goliath. He simply picked up a stone and let God direct its path. Peter didn't worry about the law of gravity. He just climbed out of the boat. What did he do? He walked on the water. Amen. Sometimes we look too much at everything around us and forget what God says and we fail to trust the Lord. And I'm guilty at times myself. We reap what we invest or we reap what we sow. This is seen in all of life. The harvest comes after the planting. The touchdown, which OU is a little short on. And so are the Cowboys. The touchdown comes after the run or the pass. In science, the discovery comes after the experiment. And the same is true in the spiritual realm. Proverbs 11, 8 says, The wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. We reap what we sow. And we reap in God's time. How many of you found that sometimes God's time doesn't line up with your time? God comes through in the due time. So what time to show up and does God show up in due time? God lives in the due time. He knows what we need and when we need it. And in due time, the Bible says we'll reap if we faint not. We reap more than we invest. In the parable of the sower, Jesus said, some reap 30 times, others reap 60 times, and others reap 100 times what was sown. So you always reap more than you sow. And that works for good or bad. If you sow destructive practices in your life, you're going to reap consequences that will be worse than what you sow. But if you practice good things, if you sow good seed, you're going to reap more than you sow. So you always reap more than you sow. Number four, God pours out His blessings. God wants to lavish His abundant supply on His children. However, God has loaned us what we have. All we have, our time, our health, our family, our friends, our intelligence, our skills, our possessions, our finance, have been given to us to do what? To manage. To manage. I don't own what's in my checking account. I just manage. It's God's money. I don't own my own body. I manage it. God's told me I need to do a little better about that this year. I don't own my house, the bank, and God owns it. <laughs> I don't own my car. It's God. I don't own my talents. I don't own anything. I simply manage what God has put in my hands. And that way, if God says to do something with some of His stuff, it's okay. If God says to give $100 in this offering, 
It's not my money. It's God's money. It takes all the pressure off when you realize who's in charge of your stuff. And if he's the owner and we're good managers, he's going to be faithful to bless us for being good managers of his stuff. That's what stewardship is all about. We're stewards or managers, but everything ultimately belongs to God. When you totally understand that it's easy to give his money, time, and talents back to him, when you understand that it's easy to do that. And there is no shortage, we've said that already, in God's economy. He owns it all, will see to it that you, you are taken care of when you put him first. Let's look at the last part. Life is an adventure. Five things I want to leave with you as we wrap this up today. Number one, Life provides us with incredible opportunities to handle what God has so freely given us. He wants us to handle His stuff responsibly. When we give back to God, we initiate the flow of His blessings. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Listen to what Paul tells the Corinthians. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will provide or, or God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's some good promises right there. He initiates the flow of the blessings back to us. Number three, when we trust the God of abundance, we can accept the giving challenge. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 7, Paul tells this same church, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in the gracious act of giving. He wants us to excel in not just certain things, but everything, and especially in the act of giving, the grace of giving. Number four, if we can trust God with our lives, why can't we commit all of our resources to Him? Let's step up to the plate and give God a chance to pour His blessings into our lives. When we give to God, we can expect a return. Malachi chapter 3, the famous tithing scripture in verse 8. Should people cheat God, yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean when we ever cheat you? You've cheated me out of tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great, you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And then in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, I think this one's on the screen up there. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. You cannot give God. Amen? Amen. There's an interesting story I want to share about a man who was hiking on the mountain. Anybody like to hike? Any hikers? Three of us, all right. I'm not. He liked to hike, and he was hiking on a mountain range, and all of a sudden he got thirsty. And to his delight, and he was really thirsty. I mean, he was wanting to get a drink really, really bad. He came across an old-fashioned pump, and he thought, hallelujah, there's a pump. 
And he stopped for a drink. Well, there was a tin cup that was tied to the pump handle. This weary traveler noticed a note in the cup and he, and he untied it and he quickly took the note from the cup and it read, quote, it is safe to drink from this well. I fixed the pump and put a new sucker washer in it. The washer dries out and the pump needs to be primed. Under the large white rock west of the well is a bottle of water. There's enough water in it to prime the pump, but not enough if you take a drink first. Pour a little of the water into the pump to soak the leather washer. Then pour in the rest of the water and pump fast. You will soon get water. The note continued, have faith. This well won't run dry. After you've pumped all the water you want, fill the bottle back up and put it where you found it. Put this note back in the cup and tie the cup to the handle. Another thirsty traveler will soon be along later. What a beautiful portrait of God's supply. This well won't run dry. God's supply won't run dry. But too many believers at times use all the water for their own thirst and don't trust God and His instructions. All right, water. Then there's nothing more to get us more water. God tells us what to do and how to do it. In conclusion, let me ask you this one. Are you trusting God? Totally. With everything. Even what He's put in your hands. Does your checkbook and your calendar prove it? If not, I challenge you to put the Lord to the test this year. He said in Malachi, test me in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. Start by giving back to God the first portion of what He puts in your hands. And you will never take that 